Our last talk in this session is going to be Patterns in Complex Aortic Vascular Surgery Training presented by Dr. Saldana Ruiz. And this is out of University of Washington. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Well, we have no relevant disclosures. The rapid evolution of vascular technology has provided trainees with exposure to many different vascular surgery procedures. One of the studies out of 2018 has demonstrated a wide variation of training experience in infrapropateal bypass and endovascular interventions. And you can see the graph below demonstrates a wide uh, variation in the training experience and particularly their comfort as they go out into um, individual practice. Previous studies have repeatedly demonstrated a decline in the training experience with open aortic surgery. Most of these studies have focused primarily on open infrarenal aortic surgery. But what about complex thoracic um, thoracoabdominal aortic surgery? We know there's a paucity of data on the training of management of thoracoabdominal disease, and gaps in our knowledge particularly exist in the training experience and the comfort level of our trainees as they graduate from their programs. So we sought to, one, evaluate training experience of vascular surgery graduates with thoracoabdominal aortic disease, examine trends of current practice in early career surgeons, and lastly, explore any desire for additional training in these fields. All U.S. vascular surgery graduates from the class of 2020 were surveyed. Their contact information was obtained uh, from the APDVS, and as well as uh, contact was made on a popular communication platform. An anonymous 28-question survey was distributed, and recent graduates self-reported number and type of thoracoabdominal procedures performed in their training, their surgeon experience in early practice, and they also responded regarding any desire for additional training in these areas. The class of 2020 was composed of 175 trainees who completed vascular surgery training. 62 of those completed our survey. And as you can see in the chart, most of these trainees were between the ages of 30 and 39. 55% of the respondents were female, and 79% had graduated from a traditional 5 plus 2 vascular surgery fellowship program. In terms of their training environment, 87% trained in a traditionally academic program, 46% trained in the U.S. Northeast, with a wide variation of regions in the country of their current practice. This was also demonstrated in their type of practice, with roughly one-third being in a traditional academic practice, another third in an academic-affiliated practice, and the last third in a private practice model. When asked about their open experience, 25% of graduates graduated with less than 20 open aortic surgery procedures of any kind. And when you look at that closer, 23% of graduates did less than five open aortic procedures for aneurysm or dissection that required a suprarenal clamp. 50% of them did less than five in these procedures that required a superciliac clamp. And overall, 66% of applicants did less than five open thoracoabdominal procedures during their training. When asked about their comfort level with open aortic surgery, 87% felt prepared and comfortable with doing open aortic surgery, and 68% felt comfortable doing these with supraciliac clamps. Only 11% felt comfortable doing open thoracoabdominal surgeries. And of note, 84% of, of the applicants reported doing these cases in current practice with a partner. When asked about complex endovascular experience, 19% of the respondents had done less than five fenestrated or branched aortic procedures of any kind. And when, you, when we broke that down even further, 56% did less than five modifi physician-modified endografts, 58% did less than five complex branch or fenestrated, that's the four vessel branch or fenestrated procedures either through a clinical trial or using a custom made device, 
and 63% at less than five uh, complex aortic procedures requiring parallel grafting. When asked about their comfort level with complex aortic surgery, 82% responded feeling prepared and comfortable doing complex aortic surgery, with 76% stating they were currently doing this in their practice. And similarly, 80% were doing this in current practice with a partner. Then we asked about desire for additional training. And 81% of respondents uh, responded a desire for additional training in open aortic surgery. And that ranged from additional training in thoracal abdominal aneurysms to abdominal aortic aneurysms with an infrarenal clamp. 72% responded a desire for additional endovascular treatment uh, and training. And this ranged from off-the-shelf fenestrated grafts to physician-modified grafts and even parallel grafting. So in conclusion, we found that training, the training experience and the treatment of thoracal abdominal aortic disease remains limited. The majority of graduates were, com were graduating with less than five open or endovascular procedures. And only 20% of our graduating um, residents and fellows were doing thoracal abdominal disease procedures without a partner. 80% of early practice surgeons responded wanting some additional training either in complex endovascular or open thoracal abdominal surgery. And we believe that these findings suggest that we need to evaluate our current paradigm and training for the management of thoracal abdominal disease. Given the relationship that we've all come to know with high volume and outcomes uh, when re with regards to complex thoracal abdominal disease, we believe efforts to improve our training may include extended training such as aortic fellowships or early career apprenticeship models like what we saw in our survey with most of our graduates continuing to learn and doing cases with a partner in early practice. Regionalization, lastly, might be something that can help centralize the care of thoracal abdominal disease, improve outcomes for patients, and also in, uh, improve the exposure of management of thoracal abdominal disease for trainees. Thank you, I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent talk. Uh, I'll start by asking one quick question. Uh, <clears throat> Were you able to uh, differentiate when you had your numbers, 81% and 72% of folks who wanted additional training, of how many of those were traditional fellows versus integrated residents? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we are, I think we're able to do that with our data. We did not do this for this particular um, study, but my, my sense is that most of our respondents were five and two would probably have very small numbers of the integrated O and five, and it'd be, I mean, it'd be interesting to see, and, and I don't think we did this with this data yet. Okay. Dr. Sheehan. Me again. Um, so I agree with all your conclusions, but I, I'm not sure that I agree with how you got there. The, there's a constant perpetuation of this myth that people aren't getting open aortic experience. And the reason is that the way the case logs report it, people look at dissection and aneurysm like you did, but a significant experience is gained in trauma and aortic occlusive disease. So you have to look at all those numbers and combine them together. And when you do that, you see that most graduates finish with 25 to 30 open aortas, fellowship and uh, integrated. So, and that's borne out by your survey, which shows that most of them are comfortable doing it, right? So how do you make that disparity work? They're, they're reporting very few cases, but they're mostly saying they're comfortable. And I think that gap is there uh, because we're not looking at the occlusive disease cases, which give them a lot of experience, you know, SMA bypass, celiac bypass, aortic endarterectomy, you know, aortic bifemoral bypass, you know, they do all aortic trauma. They do a lot of these cases that we're not accounting for by studies like yours, so I, I just, you know, when you write the manuscript, please try to look at all that so uh, we're not continuously telling the world that we're under trained aortic experience. But so, uh, if you ask people who are experienced in this room uh, where they gained the most of their experience, I would say training, yes, and then probably the first five years in practice. Mm -hmm. So what would your, I, I think that Economically, going and doing these different fellowships and things like that is probably not the way to go. So what would your model be 
economics included on how we can train more people? Do you think regionalization is the answer? And I know this is a very unfair question to ask you, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but solve this for the world right now. So should we regionalize our care and only send Thoracos to like urgent cent uh, to places of, of where it exists? Should we offer more fellowships, somehow figure out the finances behind that? Or should we kind of do this mentorship early career thing where you do you know, another couple of years of training, maybe at a higher pay level than fellowships with people who have more experience? So solve that problem for us. Got it. Thank you very much um, for your questions. Uh, in regards to your first comment, I think we, we've tried very aggressively to obtain um, case logs for the purpose of looking at how are, we, how are we getting our trainees their experience and how is it they're going into practice and feeling comfortable to adequately manage these disease processes. I think we've been um, unfortunately unsuccessful at attaining the, the case logs for these years, um, but that's something that we will continue to keep trying, and, and your, your point is well taken. Um, in regards to your second question, I think it is a very challenging question, and it's sort of the impetus to our survey. Um, how do we address this um, sort of gap in our, in our education, if some may perceive it that way, um, for particularly complex thoracoabdominal disease? And I think regionalization might be one, but I, I, I think most importantly is what we're already doing um, in early practice, which is doing most of our cases probably with senior partners or taking a job um, in an area where we can uh, work closely with someone who's more experienced and sort of continue to learn after graduation. I think the point is that um, training is not done when you're done training. Hi, Bjorn Zuko from Dartmouth. Um, well done, Anna what I would expect from the, the Washington group. Um, I guess my comment first and foremost, this is a nice snapshot of what's truly happening in our specialty. Um, this is reflective of how we're treating thoracoabdominal aortic disease. And unlike other disease processes, this is where industry is kind of hurting us, right? You're looking at TCAR and other novel therapeutics coming about. Those are globally rolled out with access globally to physicians that are really industry partnered and trained. Here you're looking at PMEGs and parallel grafts and all these stopgap uh, stop procedures because industry is just not making some novel devices available. And so that bespeaks to what we're seeing as practicing physicians, and that trickles down to our trainees. So really just a global call to everybody to partner with industry and make more devices available to all of us, which I think is going to improve also the training paradigm. That said, this is difficult surgery, especially when it comes to the open surgery. And the reality is most of us do these in partnership with other experienced surgeons. It shows better outcomes. So my question to you is, um, have you gotten a sense in your survey whether the perception among trainees is that being a, quote, third wheel is a bad thing? Um, because in reality, most trainees will be a third or fourth person scrubbing in in a procedure where you have two experienced surgeons trying to get a good outcome for one of these cases. And how can we shift that mentality? Is that by extra aortic fellowships, more time spent doing this, or is it just changing the expectation that you better scrub on these whenever you can, and if there are four of you in the case, that's just the way it's going to be? Thanks. Great. Thank you for your question. Now, I completely agree. I think um, it's, it's challenging for, for complex disease and your first point of industry and a lot of these procedures being done specifically at high volume centers and, and rightfully so as outcomes have demonstrated to be better, not just from a surge in volume experience, but also from a system experience that is prepared to take care of these patients in the perioperative period. I think um, in terms of training uh, graduates that feel comfortable, um, it's really important. Uh, I did not, we did not get a sense that being a third wheel per se was something negative. In fact, uh, one of the strengths of our survey was that it was anonymous. It did not sort of ask how many cases uh, did you do as a requirement for graduation. It was a very voluntary survey, and so I think most of our um, answers can be quite taken as, as truth, and um, most reported doing either open or endovascular procedures with a partner, which I think um, you know, is something that is commonly happening and, and we acknowledge you know, day to day in our, in our hospitals. All right, Last thank you. We're, I'm sorry, we're oh, gonna have to wrap up. Sorry. Is, no, no, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, uh, 
Thank you so much for coming to this session. Just a reminder, the case report session is gonna be in a reception-like format, and it's gonna be next door on A, so please make sure to uh, be there. Thank you, guys. Thank you.